Hello. Good morning. Just trying to get adjusted here. Okay, how's that? All right, good morning. And uh, it's really great to be here. And I think if it was up to me, we would just, I could just sit down and we could sing for another half hour, an hour or so, and that would be great. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it's great to be here in person. And uh, if I haven't had a chance to personally wish you a happy new year, wish you a happy new year. And um, I think more than that, what as Christians we can do is pray that this is a year where we can draw close to God and where he can sustain us and bring us closer to him. I think that's better than just wishes and wishful thinking. We can pray. And I think that 2021 will be a year where we need to seek the Lord and his power and his strength. And the world is a wild, crazy place right now. And things are moving faster and faster, um, it seems. But as we sang earlier, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. So I think we'll be all right. Um, as Warren says often, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Um, 1 John 5 says this, For whoever has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So if, like most people, you're aware of watching the news and stuff like that, I would say don't be afraid, but instead have faith in God. So let's pray and ask God for help this morning. And I know that I need help this morning, so I really need to pray. And um, let's just turn to him. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us along and getting us through what's been. And Lord, we look to the future and what's to come. And God, we commit ourselves. And Lord, I commit myself into your hands, Lord. And it's only by your grace that I am here and that I've come this far. Lord, where would I be if it wasn't for your love? And what do I deserve that is apart from your grace, Lord, undeserved kindness towards me, Lord. I know that I am faulty and unworthy, but Lord, um, you have brought me here, Lord, and I wish to serve you, God, and I pray that you would strengthen me, Lord. Um, I am not strong, and I am not rich in spirit, Lord. I'm poor in spirit, and I'm weak, Lord. I pray that you would give me your strength, God, and I pray that you would give me your spirit and that you would help me this morning. I pray that my words would be few and that um, that if uh, these notes are useless, that you would just help me to depart from them. But God, I pray that your word and that Christ would be central and that I would not misrepresent or misspeak in any way. Lord, please guard my mouth and, and I ask that you would help me this morning. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I'd like to begin with a reading, and um, the reading is in Romans chapter 11 and 12, just the end of Romans chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, uh, wherever you are, perhaps online um, or in here, it's good to open up to Romans 11 and 12, um, and we're going to start in Romans 11 verse 32. And it says this, For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, 
acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say that to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly, if prophecy in proportion to one's faith, if service in the act of serving, or the one who teaches in the act of teaching, or the one who exhorts in the work of exhortation, the one who gives with generosity, the one who is in leadership with diligence, the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And verse 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. I'll stop reading there. I pray that God would bless the reading of his word and um, that the tone of this whole message that I've worked on and prepared would be focused on God's word. And I know I have a lot of notes. I think I only have 12 slides. But just considering, um, I guess, the weight of the burden that I felt, I just pray that it would be God's words and none of my own that come out this morning. So a long time ago, last time I spoke, I remember starting with a picture of Ravi and these four words, the words origin, morality, meaning, and destiny. And if a worldview, yeah, it's kind of washed out, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's dying on us. Anyways, if a worldview can be described as a lens through which we see the world, these four topics are the frame in which the lens sits. That's Ravi's words. In this case, these are rectangular glasses. We've got four frames that, in which the lens sits, and this is a worldview through which we understand life. Where do we come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And what is evil and what is good? So depending on how you answer these questions, it can change a lot about how you live your life. And the Bible provides a basis to understand these questions, answer these questions, and to understand yourself and others and navigate life. The Bible is the guidebook, the ultimate guidebook to life. And so we can seek guidance in it. And depending on how you believe and what you believe, it can make the difference between sleeping soundly at night or pounding your pillow in agony, asking why, why, why? Because people do have existential problems, people do have philosophical problems, and regular people have these problems. And I think that all of us, these, these matters of the heart are fundamental and are important. So my dad told a joke a couple weeks ago, and I have to tell it again here because of what's going on. Is that this is the joke. Preachers should stick to exegetical messages, meaning a line-by-line -line or verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible. And every once in a while, venture to do a topical message. And then they should repent. Well, now is a time I really should repent. And I do, I have been repenting for quite some time. Because it seems that I've cornered myself into giving a message on the topic of the meaning of life, which I really don't recommend to try to do, because it's been talked about a lot in history, and I, I'm not the first to touch on it, and I'm doubtful that some 28-year-old kid from Dartmouth in 2021 can really do it justice or add anything to the conversation. So just, I can't leave the outline half done, and please put up with me. And um, I don't know how long this will take either, so throw the clock out, and... Um, I don't think it'll hopefully take too long. But as for Ravi, the man, I have to speak to this as well. 
Um, this is another burden that I've had. And I'm saddened to learn that his legacy has been tarnished by the sexual misconduct allegations, which by all uh, early evidence and investigations have come out to be true. Ultimately, I personally, I personally feel that his profound thinking and his ministry cannot be undone. That's just my opinion. Ravi was just a man gripped by grace, just like any other man or woman. And he made mistakes and he had failures. And if you want to read about men and women who served God but had personal failures, just read your Bible. Noah got drunk, Abraham lied, Moses struck the rock, David took Bathsheba, Peter denied Christ, and Paul repeatedly claimed to be the worst among all sinners. So because of his prominence in the intellectual arena, the damage to Ravi's testimony is damage to the testimony of all Christians. I believe that, and it stings so much because we love him so much. To me, <laughs> this, this highlights for us the need for humility and confession and transparency in the battle against sin, both at a personal level and for the church as a whole. I'm sorry. I think it takes a lot of courage for someone to confess secret sins to someone they love. And it's possible that dying could be take less courage, just taking your secrets to the grave. But even in his gravest failure, I am still learning from Ravi, and I still consider him a great teacher. And if you're a Christian, turn the lens on yourself, turn the microscope on yourself, and ask yourself, do I have secret sin? And what role does confession play in destroying the power of sin? Confession to God, yes, that's a must. But how about confession to the person your soul ho holds most dear and most loved? The courage to face that shame and disappointment of telling someone that you love your failures, that courage, I think, only comes from Christ the man who can overcome that kind of shame and bear that kind of shame. I think we need to seek God earnestly, all Christians everywhere, if we're going to recover from this kind of thing. And, and tons, tons and tons of stories of great men and women falling suddenly out of nowhere, and you learn, like, it's not what it looked like. And this is hypocrisy. This verse is the ultimate foil against sin, 1 John 1, 7. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's like a spiritual shower. We just, we need that verse. It's a foil. I think fellowship is a really good indicator of health, of spiritual health. We ask ourselves, how is our fellowship with our loved ones and with the church? I pray that God would give us his strength and his grace and his, humil his humility and give us of his courage to overcome every obstacle and lay claim to the victory that is set before us. I firmly believe that each of us can walk in the light, but not in our own strength. So let's seek God's strength. And failure is only final if we stop praying and stop seeking God and stop asking God for help. So let us seek God continually. And with that, that's been addressed. Let's move on to the topic at hand. Okay, so what can give our lives meaning? Around 10 years ago, I was with some friends in high school, and I remember asking and talking about this question, having a discussion, and I was eventually shocked by how different our worldviews were. These were two of my secular friends. 
And from a very young age, from basically from the beginning, I grew up in a Christian worldview. And so from the beginning, I consider meaning to be an ins- essential ingredient in life. Can't go without it. Uh, and it was not so for my friends. And I remember the long discussion coming to a point, and my f- one of my friends said, I don't think life necessarily has meaning, and I don't really think my life necessarily, I don't think I really need it in order to have a happy life, and I don't need that. Well, okay, at some point, that stopped me in my tracks, and, and I think that ended the conversation, but at some point, I believe that my friend will change his mind. And just last Friday, I was talking to a stranger on the street who was beginning to be hostile towards the preacher and um, starting to heckle and stuff, and and he was very hostile towards religion in general. And my friend Nick Provo asked, so where do you go when you die? What happens to you? And he said, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I, I just get eaten by worms and I become dirt. And Nick asked, well, what about your soul? And what about... What happens to that part of you? And he said, ah, I don't believe that. I don't believe any of that stuff. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in religion. And all religion is bad. And so I said to this guy, well, a total stranger, I said, well, yeah, man, man-made religions are all very flawed. That's true. But what we're actually interested in is not religion. We're not interested in just, you know, man-made clubs and stuff like that. What we want and what we believe we have is truth. All we want is truth. Like, what is the truth? There's gravity. That's a truth. Like, one plus one is truth. One plus one is two is truth. <laughs> yeah, you can tell I'm a little rattled up here. But, um, and we said, I said, this is what the Bible says. This is what we believe in true, is true. This is the message. You have a soul. Your life is valuable. Your life can be meaningful. You can have forgiveness of sins. You can have peace with God. You can have p- everlasting life and you can go to heaven. We're out here because this is a wonderful message that we believe people need to hear. And right then, like some kind of off-the-wall Satanist people walked by and started screaming at the preacher. And the stranger guy said, he kind of looked at them, and he was like, whoa. And he said, I won't accept what you're saying. He said something like this. I won't accept what you're saying to me, but I'm not like them either. You're both too extreme, and I'm moderate. And then the conversation was over. And some nights are like that downtown, and every interaction is just softening hard ground a little bit. And that's still good. And just like my friend from high school, I believe that that stranger on the street will someday change his mind. What can give our lives meaning? Different nations have vastly different cultures. I have up here pictures from India, and Japan, and the USA, and France. Crowds and crowds of people. Individuals on the planet Earth have a vast range of experiences. We like different things, we feel different things, we think differently, we look different, we come from different backgrounds, and multiply that by 7.8 billions. All of us unique. All of us with different perspectives and different needs, different struggles. I guess two people can look at the same painting and one person can, one person can go, wow, man, like, this is really profound, amazing, this is so meaningful, look at this painting. And the next person can come and see the same exact painting and go, what is this? Why is this on the wall? My five-year-old could paint this. Same thing with music. Some people can listen to a song and say, wow, like, amazing music, this is so profound, this is really meaningful. And the next person can say, turn that off. It, That sounds terrible. So what can cut across all these differences and meet each of us where we are and give our lives meaning? Well, you and I know the the real question is actually who can give our lives meaning? But please humor me while I develop this idea of what can give our lives meaning. Um, As much as we're different, we are also the same. Each of us, every one of us, has a soul uniquely crafted by God, and every one of us needs Christ Jesus as Savior to save us from sin, to save us from ourselves, and to save us from hell. I firmly believe that all humans hunger and thirst spiritually 
just as much as all humans hunger and thirst physically. There are so many people on this planet, yes, and we all have this in common. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's like a universal self-evident truth. I've never met someone who I can say they're perfect, except Jesus, but we've only met him in a sense, you know what I mean? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Notice the universality of God's truth, and that's part of the beauty of it. All have sinned, everyone, everyone who believes in him, that's everyone, and so that no one can boast, that's also no one, okay? So everyone is under God's truth, and it's universal. It's not pay to play, there's no entry level ability test, it's just universal truth. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're born, it doesn't matter what language you speak or how much money you have or what your abilities are. God's truth is equally for you and for all people. And salvation is equally for you and for all people. I believe that everyone wants meaning in life, but lots of people, and sadly I can say I think most people, look for it in the wrong way and the wrong places, and most people aren't willing to pay the price that it comes with a meaningful life. So, I think the first trap, I'm gonna really speed it up here. I think the first, I'm gonna try. Oh man, I'm gonna try. I'm not even done my introduction. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so a lot of people look for meaning in consumerism and materialism. I think it's probably the most common trap and I guarantee that there is no satisfaction in stuff. I don't care what it is. I put up some random pictures of like stuff, uh, but you can put up whatever here that you love that's material, like cars, iPhones, guitars, houses, riches, land, silver, gold, whatever you like, put it up there. There is no meaning in materialism. Uh, in Numbers 11, we read about the Israelites, and it, it says this, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now the rabble who were among them had greedy cravings, and the sons of Israel also wept and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish that we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our appetite is gone. There is nothing to look at except all of this manna. Okay, not only is materialism totally futile, it's offensive to God. And people are the same as the Israelites were today. Lots of people, and they say, Ah, yes! This cucumber-scented facial moisturizer will ease my existential dread somehow. And it's only $200 per bottle. Excellent. All my problems are gone. Okay, materialism is total futility. A lot of people look for popularity and fame to fill their life with meaning. More likes, more followers, more fame, more recognition. Okay, I'm going to speed up over this, but the summary is that the fame game is futility. Okay, this whole thing is built on hypocrisy. It's all built on manufactured things. And it's so blatantly obvious sometimes, but the cycle continues and people still buy into it. And some people don't even look for meaning in this life, they just escape into another life and buy into whatever entertainment or whatever that they can escape into. Next, seek your next thrill, seek your next video game, seek your next time your team scores a goal, immerse yourself in the statistics and the details, immerse yourself in social media, scroll, 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 like, scroll, 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 angry, scroll, 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 sad, stay distracted all the time, stay numb, stay oh, so obsessed and so immersed in your world of choice that you don't have to face reality and face the real world. Escapism is definitely futility. We could definitely go on a lot more on the futility of the spiritual prison system that has been developed by spiritual powers of evil and darkness 
that people are stuck in. There's enough of the world out there for people to be lost their entire lives and never realize it. It's a lot, um, but the truth needs to be out there. Jesus was a master of cutting through all the cobwebs and dross and cutting to the quick. He said this to his disciples. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay each person according to his deeds. Really cuts to it. And so there's a choice and there's a cost to be a disciple of Jesus and there is a cost to having a meaningful and satisfied life. But I have always considered it to be the lesser of two costs. Because you can choose to serve yourself and be a slave to your own needs, your own wants, and your own desires. Whatever cruel idols your heart creates for you to serve, like materialism or popularity or entertainment, those idols will demand more and more of your life, and your soul will never have true satisfaction. In the engineering world, we have a thing called positive feedback. That's what that is. And any system with positive feedback is a system that this quality will cause it to be unstable and self-destruct. It's even true in inanimate things. And choice number two, you can serve God and become a slave to Christ and die to yourself, die to your own wants, your own needs, your own desires, and just serve the living God, the Most High God. Serve Him, cast yourself upon Him, and be a disciple of Christ. Okay, in the engineering world, this is called negative feedback. And if you have something like an amplifier, the result is called gain, an output that's larger than the input. There's a cost to being a servant of God, and that cost is your life. But what you get back is better than life. David really understood this in Psalm 63. He wrote, O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. I believe that to be true. God's love is really what this is all about. So what do we mean by meaning? because I keep going on about this, but it's really a hazy word. I think if two people were to explain it, you you could get quite different explanations. And I only have really two verses to get through, so please bear with me. Um, And keep your finger in Romans 12 if you can. So what do we mean by meaning? I think most people can agree, perhaps, on these three breakdown points of what meaning is. And... I'm a kind of person who has a tall order for life for some reason. I don't really know why, but I think big, dream big. I I want big things. In life, I want satisfaction. And like King David said of God, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. And you're probably thinking about the rich feast of lunch that you're going to go to when I finally let you go. (laughs) You've had lots of good food, but you get hungry again. And I want more than that. I want more than what the world has to offer. I want deep, lasting, spiritual satisfaction in my heart of hearts, in my inner person, in the depths of my soul. I don't want just temporary, superficial satisfaction. Does God offer that? In life, I want purpose. I want a reason to get out of bed in the morning. I want a mission. I want a cause, something I can put my energy and effort into and know that it is worthy of my energy and effort. 
not just stuff that's going to break down and burn up eventually anyway, like fixing my car. It's just going to break down eventually. It's good for so many kilometers, and then it's gone. But I want to put my life into something eternal, a purpose that reaches into eternity. Does God offer that? In life, I want significance. I want my life to make a mark in history or in some way. If you could turn my life into a painting, I would want people to react like they do to a profound painting and say, wow, look at this. This has significance. This means something. This tells me something. I want people to stop and wonder and look and say, huh. When it's all said and done, I would like my life to have some significance. Does God offer that? I'm asking a lot from life, I know. But let's go back to Romans 12 and consider what God has for us and what God asks of us. These verses are like treasures to me. I think that they have had quite an impact in my life as I've come back to them and read them over and over again. It says, therefore, and that therefore is probably one of the biggest therefores in the Bible, but for time's sake, I can't really do the whole thing justice. But you can read about the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God and the mind of God and these mysteries that we deal with. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Where is there satisfaction in life? I ask for satisfaction. There is satisfaction in the mercies of God. I can be saved by the mercy of God. I can have my sins forgiven and have peace with God, access to God, access to his strength, access to his joy. Without experiencing the mercy of God, I don't think I could ever be satisfied with life. But with God, I can have spiritual satisfaction that is true and lasting. Okay, where is their purpose in life? in presenting myself, including my body and my mind, as a living and holy sacrifice to God, to die to myself, and my purpose is to do his bidding, which is your spiritual service of worship. It's basically, you could summarize it as worship. I can serve the most high living God who created the universe and me and you, and he upholds everything by the power of his will. There is no better boss to work for, I guarantee it. A hundred thousand million stars in the sky and in the universe, and 7.6 billion souls right now, and everyone that's ever lived, and each one of those, unique. No two the same. Each person having worth and value. Souls that God desires to be saved. The work of the gospel has eternal impact. It's not wood, hay, and stubble that's going to be burned up. It's gold, silver, and precious stones. By God's grace, I can take part in his work and walk in those things that he has prepared for me. I can be obedient to him. And with God, I have a spiritual purpose in life. The work of the gospel and the work of the church. Where is their significance in life? In the transformation and sanctification of God. I can be renewed in my mind and be a new creation. I can live in victory over sin, proving that the power of God is effective to save and to sanctify, not in my own strength, but relying on his. I can be different in a good way, not conformed to this world, so different, but in a good way. My life can be evidence of God's grace and proof of his power. 
So it says that you may prove what the will of God is. In summary, this, these verses have been my meaning verses in life. And I'd like to point out one last thing, I think pretty much well out of time, but having a relationship with God is definitely better than anything else on this planet, especially in the long term. If you're looking for meaning and satisfaction and purpose and significance in life, I recommend devoting your life to God, being saved, and pursuing him with everything that you have. And there's one word in this that I'd like to highlight, and it's this word, spiritual. In the NASB, this verse 1 is said, it is your spiritual service to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. And that word is kind of based on a word, it's often translated reasonable, and it's kind of based on a word that sounds a lot like logical. Reasonable service. I believe that in life, meaning is found in God's love. God loves me. What would be a reasonable response? I love God. God is my father. What's a reasonable response? I'm his son. He gave his life for mine. What's a reasonable response? I give my life for his. I'm his and he's mine. As it turns out, having this kind of relationship, this connection with the God of the entire universe does a good job of filling life with meaning. Life, meaning in life, doesn't come from things or experiences. It comes from a person knowing God and having an appropriate and reasonable response to God. Isaiah 53 says of Jesus, he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. When I think and ponder about Jesus and what he gave for my salvation and the price that he paid for my life so that I wouldn't have to pay that, I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from sin. I think it's reasonable that I should give God my utmost for his highest. And the mind-blowing part about this is that it's just grace all the way. And God just keeps blessing and blessing. And his grace is inexhaustible. And the more you look at it, the more it makes sense not to hold back anything because you can't keep it anyways. And it's just the best thing in life. Remember the Shema. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. I'd like to go on and say one more thing. It says in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. All of this falls apart if we have sin in our lives. I'm really grieved by Ravi, but I'm also really grieved by myself. And I think if you could take any one of us or anyone you admire or anyone you look up to and project their thoughts on the wall like this projector is projecting, you'd be disappointed in anyone. But let's cling to what is good and let's cling to God and pursue him and pursue him with all our might, all of our strength, and let's be transformed And God's grace will get us through. And there's grace. I don't think Ravi, it's not like he wasn't saved. Just look at all the people in the Bible. 
and look at me. I'm a sinner, but I'm saved by grace, and I don't deserve, I don't even deserve to say anything to you. I don't deserve to handle the word of God. I don't deserve to be a teacher in any sense. What I deserve is more like what Jesus got, what I would deserve if I was just judged on the basis of myself. I, you'd say, well, he's a criminal. Put him on a cross, kill him. That's what he deserves. But it's grace instead. So I pray that someone got something out of that, and that was a crushing burden, but um, in a good way. And I pray that the Lord would sustain us and fill our lives with meaning. And let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. Thank you that we can even know these things. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a miracle that I have been saved, and I know it well. And I pray for everyone here that the miracle of salvation would be fresh and would be vibrant and that we would have living power and that we would walk in the spirit, Lord. And I pray that we would have unity and I pray that we would have fellowship and I pray that we would walk in the light and have fellowship with one another and have fellowship with Christ. I pray that there would be no shadows among us and in me and in my own life, Lord. Whatever it takes, God, I pray that I would be further with you and further towards you and that I could worship you for the rest of my existence, Lord. And I pray that as we go, that you would protect us, that you would be with us, be among us, protect us in this world, protect us from the world. And Lord, we believe in you and we believe in your power. We know that you can do this, Lord. You're not diminished in 2021. You're mighty to save, and you've saved us. You're mighty to keep us. I pray that you would preserve us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a song. <laughs>